Hello and welcome to IR Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. Today we're going to have a look on Syria. Syria has been in war, in conflict for over 12 years. And I want to know what's going on in Syria, how the Syria is doing at the moment, and what we can expect in the future in terms of Syria. I'm joined by Professor Christopher Phillips. Hello, Chris. Hi, Martin. Hi. Christopher Phillips is a professor of international relations at Queen Mary, University of London. He is recognized for his specialization in the Middle East. Having lived in Syria for several years, he maintains his connection to the region through research trips to the Middle East. Professor Phillips is also a respected author, contributing to high-profile academic journals. He also writes for The Guardian, The Washington Post and The Atlantic. He wrote three books, and one of the most famous one is The Bottle for Syria, International Rivalry in the New Middle East. However, his latest book is going to be published in 2024 by Yale University Press, and it's going to be the battleground, the struggle for the New Middle East in 10 conflicts. So I think Chris is a very good expert to tell us something about Syria. And I'm very happy that he found some time to join us for this interview. So let's start with the first question. We know something about Syria and ISIS. However, in the last years, we heard that ISIS was defeated in Syria. So what's the current situation? Are there any remaining of ISIS in Syria? And what does it mean for the Middle East? And what sort of implications? Can you see? Sure. Um, well, the, the basic situation with ISIS is um, it, it has been defeated physically in terms of the so-called caliphate that it declared 2014-2015 uh, time period. Uh, this was a physical threat that it posed at the time, as we can all recall, it captured the Syrian city of Raqqa, the Iraqi city of Mosul, and various other cities and populated areas um, in between. And it expanded considerably. And, and one of its greatest threats, of course, was the power of attraction that it commanded. Remember, this was the time when a large number of um, foreign um, people who claimed they were waging jihad uh, traveled over to Syria or Iraq to join the caliphate. So at that time, it was this sort of territorial threat to the Middle East. That territorial threat has now been, has now largely ended. You know, the, the combined uh, energies of uh, uh, the Iraqi military, the um, uh, Iranian military, the, uh, uh, the um, Syrian Kurdish dominated fighters on the ground, um, to an extent, some of Assad's, uh, Assad, the president of Syria's forces in the east, and of course, this huge uh, aerial um, uh, campaign led by the United States and its allies, have, to all intents and purposes, destroyed the so-called caliphate. All of the physical territory has been captured. Um, Al Baghdadi, who declared himself who's the, who the leader of uh, of, uh, of ISIS, was killed. So several of his his uh, successors as so-called caliphs and so on. So that physical presence is no longer there. That does not mean that the idea of ISIS has gone away. Um, it is still just about the sort of uh, uh, the the benchmark where it, when it comes to global jihadism. Those people that are attracted to the idea of international jihad historically align themselves with Al Qaeda. After 2014, they start aligning themselves with ISIS. And we're still in kind of the world of cyberspace and, and various other um, online activities. That competition is still going on. You know, ISIS is still there in that sense. And people do still uh, view them as the, the, the uh, international jihadist group they would like to join. So that, that is in an important role they continue to play. Inside Syria and Iraq, there are still, from what we believe, a limited number of cells that are still hiding, uh, some in urban areas, some in sort of, you know, the desert, but small clusters of people, the kind that could launch a um, uh, a terrorist campaign against the Syrian government or the Iraqi government, but probably couldn't bring together uh, the same kind of 
insurgency that was launched at various stages in the early 2010s. The other way in which ISIS continues to exist is the large number of fighters who are prisoners who are still in prison in Syria held by the Kurdish-dominated Syrian Democratic Forces, which were the United States ally um, in the campaign against ISIS. There's a good 10,000 of them locked up in various prisons. Um, most aren't Syrian or Iraqi. Most of them are actually foreigners. But, you know, there have been various attempts by, by these ISIS cells that still exist in Iraq and Syria to break them out of prison. Some have been successful. Others have failed. Um, the few that have been successful, the few sort of hundred or thousand that have escaped, most of them were then recaptured. Um, but some did escape. But that potential is still there that actually we could get these kind of prison breaks. Um, but I think the sort of the overall picture is that you're looking at a what had been a, a major territorial threat, having now been reduced to a, a terrorist threat. You know, it's still going to be a thorn in the side of Middle Eastern governments and maybe even, you know, governments in Europe and the United States in the form of isolated terrorist attacks. But at this moment in time, it's hard to see them rebuilding that territorial threat, you know, a new caliphate as they did in the mid 2010s. Right. When you mention Al Qaeda and ISIS, for many students, that's almost the same thing. So let's clarify if Al Qaeda and ISIS in Syria for our students so they know who is who and are they both of them in Syria? Yes, they are both in Syria, but they, they have similar origins and different outcomes. So ISIS, um, ISIS originated as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So you had this organization that everyone's well aware of, I believe, which is Al-Qaeda, which is formed by um, uh, Osama bin Laden and his teacher, Al-Zawahiri. And they... Um, uh, originated from the, the Mujahideen that had fought in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. Uh, and then after the end of that war, at the end of the late 1980s, early 1990s, they formed Al-Qaeda, which became this international terrorist group based very, variously in, in Sudan and then back in, um, back in Afghanistan, from which they launched the 9-11 attacks. Now, of course, after the 9-11 attacks, the United States uh, concluded that the the, the one of the threats uh, to the United States came from Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and so invaded Iraq on the premise that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction and that he had links with Al-Qaeda and could possibly pass on those weapons of mass destruction to Al-Qaeda. Now, of course, neither of those things were true. He no longer had weapons of mass destruction and he had no weapon and he had no links to Al-Qaeda. However, because the United States invaded Iraq, destroyed the state. Uh, Iraq actually then became this magnet for people that wanted to join Al-Qaeda and actually liked the idea of Al-Qaeda's message of international jihad. And so even though Al-Qaeda itself was based in it, caves in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan, and as we later discovered, Pakistan, uh, a new Al-Qaeda branch was spontaneously formed in Iraq amongst jihadists, both Iraqis and international people coming to fight against the Americans. And from that, we get this group, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So officially part of Al-Qaeda, but it's sort of Iraqi branch. And they swore loyalty to Osama bin Laden um, as their sort of leader. As the years went by, this group in Iraq became increasingly independent of, of Al-Qaeda itself. Officially, it was still nominally aligned with al-Qaeda, but it was doing its own thing. And interestingly, its new leader, al-Baghdadi, uh, changed the name from al-Qaeda in Iraq to Islamic State in Iraq, and then Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, when during the Syrian civil war, they crossed into Syria and captured Syrian territory as well. And then eventually they just named themselves Islamic State. Now, this is where I guess a bit confusing, and I apologize to your, to your listeners who may uh, not, not be following this. Um, so officially at this point, you have Islamic State in Iraq and Syria still nominally allied and uh, loyal to al-Qaeda. Now, Baghdadi sent someone else into Syria ahead of him, like an advanced party, a Syrian called Mohammed al-Jolani. And Mohammed al-Jolani... Um, 
secretly went into Syria and formed another jihadist group. Um, uh, Jubhat al-Nusra, they were called. And they operated in Syria from very early on in the Syrian civil war, but kept their, their uh, origins, their links to Al-Qaeda in Iraq that had become Islamic State in Iraq secret. And they kept this secret right up until the point when uh, Islamic State in Iraq crossed into Syria, captured Raqqa and said, right, we are now the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And importantly, they said, we are no longer affiliated with Al-Qaeda. They are different to us. They just, you know, it was kind of like a, an ideological difference. You know, Al-Qaeda wanted to sort of uh, take a slowly, slowly approach, whereas Islamic State wanted to create the Islamic State now and actually create, you know, start state building. And at this point, the leader, the, the so-called caliph of Islamic State, al-Baghdadi, said, and not only are we no longer loyal to al-Qaeda, but actually this other group, Jubhat al-Nusra, formed by Muhammad al-Jolani, that we, you know, um, that have been operating for years in Syria, they're actually our guys. We, you know, we sent them in and, you know, they're, they're with us. At which point Jolani turned around and said, no, actually, yes, you did send me over, but actually I don't want to end my loyalty to al-Qaeda. So uh, this is the moment when you get a split, when actually you have inside Syria, Jubhat al-Nusra, who are still officially loyal to al-Qaeda. And at the same time, you have Islamic State, who are repudiating al-Qaeda and saying, basically, they're not radical en uh, enough for us. So then you have these two jihadist groups inside Syria who really don't get on with one another anymore. They sort of disagreed with each other. Now, to go back to your earlier point, al-Qaeda, um, the group known as Jabhat al-Nusra, went through various evolutions. They try to moderate and later say that they, whilst they had been part of Al-Qaeda, they no longer uh, affiliated themselves with them. And they changed their name to Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. And they are still operating in Syria. They are the dominant force in the rebel enclave of Idlib, which is the last part of Syria that the, the, the rebels, the original rebels that rebelled against President Bashar al-Assad still hold. And the dominant force there is this group that used to be affiliated with Al-Qaeda, but now say that they're not and say we, we're, not, we're not part of them. So there are these two ideological strands out there, but interestingly, officially in Syria now, no group is aligned with either Islamic State or Al-Qaeda because the Islamic State have been destroyed and Jabhat, uh, sorry, uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham no longer affiliate with, with Al-Qaeda. However, there are still a few pockets and cells, like I said, of both groups, um, ready to sort of wage sort of minor terrorist attacks. So they're there, but they're not the really major players anymore. When I had a lecture this semester and some students were not able to understand one, one issue, Assad, President Assad, is always portrayed as sort of, you know, dictator, like strong president, strong feast in Syria. How is it possible that such a strong leader allowed those terrorists to settle in Syria? Well, yes, I mean, it's, it's a good question. And it's one that has several explanations. So firstly, Bashar al-Assad himself uh, plays a, played a, a major role in the presence of jihadist terrorists inside Syria for several reasons. Firstly, during the 2000s, when the Americans invaded, and the British uh, invaded uh, Iraq, um, the Syrian government was absolutely terrified that were the invasion of Iraq to be successful, then Syria would be next. And in fact, you know, the American government led by George W. Bush even talked about this axis of evil, which had added Syria to a second, a secondary strand. The first axis was Iraq, Iran and North Korea. And then it added, I think, Syria, Venezuela and Cuba or something a bit odd like that. But they had specifically said, like, you know, we're targeting Syria as well. So Assad was very worried about this happening and so was determined for the Americans to be deterred from trying something like that in Syria by making sure that Iraq was a horrible quagmire that they didn't want to repeat. So to do that, they encouraged jihadists that were, were Syrian. There were Syrians, you know, that, that had a jihadist, you know, ideology, not many. But they encouraged them to travel through Syria 
over the uh, the Iraqi border to go and wage jihad inside Iraq. So they actually had sort of almost created their own, what's been labeled by some as the jihadist highway. Like they actually encourage people who had these views, you know, not to stop having those views, but quite the opposite, you know, keep having those views, but just go and fight over in Iraq. Now, of course, when the, the war in Iraq finished or, you know, people gave up and went home, some of those jihadists crossed back into Syria and they may not have immediately uh, fought the Syrian government. They were there, you know, waiting and willing to do so. Um, and then when uh, the Syrian uprising began in 2011, Assad deliberately militarized it. So there was, you know, a peaceful movement against Assad's rule. Um, Assad claimed that all the people that were peacefully protesting were terrorists, and his forces tried to violently repress um, those those protests. He believed that because he'd got his own armed forces, he would be able to relatively easily crush this sort of you know improvised violent insurgency that he hoped to provoke. So on the one hand, he created a situation where he was encouraging people to be violent. And unsurprisingly, some people were, not all, but some did take up arms and they formed rebel militia, initially with the, the, the overall name of the Free Syrian Army. But of course, amongst those fighters were those jihadists that had come back from Iraq that he himself had encouraged to be, you know, to fight, who were like, well, you know, actually, Assad, we don't like him either. You know, he's a a secular leader, um, he's an Alawi, uh, um, which is his, his, his ethnic religion, um, where mo most jihadists are Sunnis, so they, they saw Assad as a, as a heretic, and therefore, you know, were willing to fight him. So, you know, he created the circumstances of a civil war, and he'd created this, the situation in which there were quite a few quite well-trained armed jihadists already secretly living in Syria, ready to take up arms. He then did something else to sort of provoke the presence of, of jihadists, which was he released a load of jihadists from prison in 2011. And this is also one of his strategies. He was worried about um, the peaceful protest movement. And he was also worried that they seemed like a very reasonable bunch of people. They were calling for democracy. They were calling for an end to his dictatorship. And he was worried that the sort of the, the Syrian silent majority would be swayed by their arguments. Like actually, yeah, you know, actually a future under them would be better than a future under Assad. So not only did he always claim that they were terrorists in order to scare people, the silent majority, to, into not siding with, uh, with the rebels and with the protest movement, he also claimed they were all jihadists, which of course the majority of Syrians were very scared of, especially those that weren't Sunni. And there's quite a few, you know, about 10% of the population are Alawi, like Assad, about 10% were Christian, a further sort of 3% were Druze, another 1% or 2% were Shia. So these people were sort of worried of the idea of, and of course there's a lot of Sunnis who are secular and not interested in religious rule of any sort. So Assad released all these jihadists with the hope that they would actually end up dominating the opposition and squeeze out those moderates to confirm the message that he's already, already been saying that actually these people aren't reasonable, they're not moderate, they're violent, they're jihadists and they're terrorists. And therefore it justifies this violent response and also it would deter the average Syrian from joining them. So it's a survival tactic. And of course, in many ways, the rise of Islamic State was exactly what Assad wanted. He wanted the, uh, you know, the opposition to be dominated by radical jihadists who he could say, right, you know, they're terrorists, we can deal with them violently, which is largely what happened. There's a fascinating story, I think, because, you know, from, from a logical point of view, if you want to keep the country in your hands, you try to clean all the opposition voices and all the opposition movements, and suddenly, you know, you are relying basically on the Islamic State fighters in some way. That's, that's my impression. That's correct, but bear in mind that this was a divide and rule tactic. And in some way, in a very brutal and cruel way, it was a, a tactic that worked and that was successful. You know, in 2011, 2012, Assad was seriously facing the reality that we don't know for certain, but it was possible that more people wanted him gone in Syria than didn't want him gone. And so if 
all of the opposition were united, then they might have overthrown him. But the jihadist factor created a dividing line. So it, divide, it meant that the, the rebels were divided into jihadists and into you know, more, more moderate rebels. And this meant that actually fighters coming from abroad were split on, on, on where, where to go. Syrians themselves were split on who to fight for. Um, money from outside of Syria that was going in to support um, the rebels was going in different directions. You had this interesting situation whereby um, uh, governments like Turkey and Saudi Arabia and the United States and Qatar weren't quite sure who to send the money to. There wasn't just one rebel group. And so um, they you know, sent to lots of different groups who ended up fighting one another, often on ideology. Some were actually quite radical Islamists. Some even ended up being jihadists that went over to join ISIS. Um, and so therefore, the presence of lots of groups, which Assad had helped to control, you know, to, to, to create, split the foreign funding as well, which ended up splitting the opposition. And you also have the situation you know, linked to the international dimension, which is the presence of jihadists really scared the United States from getting too heavily involved. They didn't want another Afghanistan situation, whereby in the 1980s, they had funded the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union. And then 10 years later, that same Mujahideen had turned into Al-Qaeda and attacked them in 9-11. So they were very worried about the presence of jihadists. So the more the, jih the more jihadists that Assad could get onto the streets, fighting with the rebels, the more that deterred the United States. So again, a truly brutal survival tactic for Assad, but one that largely worked. If we underline everything what's in Syria at the moment, and just as a simple question, who is fighting in Syria at the moment? Very few people are actually fighting it. it it's now taking the characteristic of a frozen conflict. And, and the last time fighting really um, was heavy was in um, early 2020. So we're now looking at three years of relative calm and stability. I think the best way of, um, of understanding it now for people that aren't familiar is that Syria is roughly divided into three unequal zones now. The largest zone by far is the area controlled by Assad. So Assad fought this long war, recapturing territory that the rebels captured. So, so large parts of Syria were internally captured. You know, this was protesters rising up, um, uh, you know, f chasing away the security forces, saying that this area was now liberated, um, militia forming to defend from the from, from the art from Assad's army to retake it, um, and holding the ground for several years. And over several years, with a lot of help from Iran, from Hezbollah, from Russia, Assad was able to retake the vast majority of the territory that it lost. Most importantly, it re Assad retook the most populated parts of Syria. So Western Syria is the most populated part of Syria. It's where most of the cities are. Um, and almost all of the cities, including the second city of Aleppo, half of which was lost, to the rebel forces were recaptured by Assad with help from Russia and Iran and Hezbollah. So that's the majority of Syria now in Assad's hands. You then have Eastern Syria, which is actually very neatly divided uh, by the river Euphrates, which, which cuts diagonally across uh, Syria from basically the Turkish border in the Northwest down to the Iraqi border in the Southeast. And North of that, river of the Euphrates is the area that's controlled by Kurdish dominated forces supported by the United States. So this is a coalition known as the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is dominated by the Kurdish militia, the PYD. I might talk about that later, but you know, um, and they were supported by the United States from the air and on the ground with special forces to destroy ISIS in Syria, in, in, in Iraq. That was the job done by the Iraqi armed forces, but in Syria, the Americans and, and the wider coalition, such as the British and others, supported the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is dominated by Kurds. And they now control a really large area of eastern Syria that's quite sparsely populated. So it's mostly desert. There's a few cities. I mean, the far north, you have sort of like some agricultural areas. Um, you also have oil fields, Syria's oil fields are all in that area. But it's quite sparsely populated in general. Um, and that area 
um, is com comprises of, of two zones. One area in the north is the sort of historical Kurdish heartland. Um, uh, and then further down south towards the desert and the Iraqi border, you have areas that was historically populated by Arabic tribes. And they have a sort of a, the, the Kurds and the Arabic tribes have a sort of a loose sort of, you know, modus vivendi, um, living under the rule of the Syrian Democratic Forces, which has elected councils and um, is relatively pacified now. This is often where the, the pockets of ISIS cells pop up, but actually it's still a relatively pacified area. And importantly, this area only exists because the United States Air Force is still there and protecting them. If the United States withdrew tomorrow, either Assad or possibly Turkey, which we can talk about later, would probably seek to take all or much of that territory. And then you have a third area, which is the area con still controlled by the rebels, which is up in the far northwest of Syria, along the Kurd along the Turkish border, um, and that too has two different areas within it. One is the area around Idlib, which remember I said earlier is uh, dominated by the previously jihadist group, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, who have now denounced jihadism. Uh, and that area around Idlib is very, very densely populated. It's full of refugees who have fled as Assad reconquered um, rebel areas and the other rest of Syria, lots of rebel fighters and their families and others that are sympathetic to the rebels fled to Idlib. So even though Idlib originally only had a population of a few hundred thousand, that area now has about three or four million living in it. Very densely populated. And it's protected by Turkey. Turkey very much you knew that the last fighting that took place in 2020 was basically between Assad, Iran and Russia fighting against the rebels and Turkey. And that war only really ended when Turkey sent in its military and said to Russia, listen, if you keep fighting here, you will be fighting the Turkish military and it will be a Turkish, Turkish Russian war. We don't want that, do we? So that that was sort of when the last fighting took place. Um, around that area of Idlib. And then there's a final area, just worth noting, um, a li little bit beyond Idlib, uh, which is a a three separate pockets of rebel-held territory, which are um, controlled by or directly by Turkey. So these are areas that originally weren't rebel. They were actually originally controlled by, by the either ISIS or the Kurdish forces. And Turkey invaded those in order to push ISIS and those Kurdish forces away from its border. And it is it now administers those through a group of rebels that it created itself, primarily for the purpose of fighting ISIS, fighting um, the Kurds and administering these um, pro-Turkish pockets of, of, uh, of, of Syria. And those areas are both a protective pocket to stop Kurds and ISIS back in the day, but now it's just Kurds from, from being right on Turkey's border. But it's also used as uh, a place for Turkey to relocate some of its Syrian refugees. It has about 4 million refugees actually living in Turkey and, and increasingly the Turkish domestic population aren't happy about so many Syrian refugees being in Syria. So at different times, Turkey has used those pockets to relocate some Syrian refugees to live there. But th those areas are largely, uh, they're effectively Turkish proxies. They use Turkey's currency. They use the Turkish education system. They're connected to the Turkish grid. You know, the Turkish Red Crescent operate there. The Turkish post office operate there. You know, so even though they are part of Syria, they're very much Tur to Turkish pockets. But they are um, still broadly run by anti-Assad rebels. That's their origin. So they're the sort of three pockets. As Turkey is a significant player, can we... Can we assess the key objectives, what Turkey wants in Syria? Because, because when you say the Turkish post office is in Syria, you know, Turkey is involved in one zone in Syria, then in the second zone where are the Kurds. So it's quite significant portion of Syria where we can see Turkey or Turkish influence. Hugely. Turkey is very invested in Syria. Bear in mind that Syria is to Turkey's longest border. And this is a border that's 800 kilometers long. It's very, very long. Turkish 
Turkey's approach has changed over the course of the war. At the very beginning of the war, it was actually quite good friends with Assad, and it believed that it could persuade Assad to stop crushing the protesters and to reform internally. Assad said he would do so, uh, but then went back on his promise, and that really angered Turkey's leader, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who completely turned on him and instead started sponsoring the rebels. Turkey miscalculated. It believed that Assad would fall very quickly in the same way in 2011, uh, the leaders of, of uh, Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and, and soon afterwards Yemen also fell. Um, but in fact, that didn't happen. Assad actually proved far more resilient. He got a lot more help from first Iran and then from Russia, and he managed to stay in power. Turkey, though, left itself open to, to problems because it was the main sponsor or one of the main sponsors of the rebellion. And it, it left its, its long border completely open for fighters to go in and out of, tu of Turkey. Um, it let the, 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 the rebels have their base in Turkey. It didn't pay enough attention to jihadists pa passing through Turkey to go and join, firstly, you know, groups like Jabhat al-Nusra and later on ISIS when they emerged. And suddenly, in around 2013, 2014, Turkey realized there was this horrendous civil war on its doorstep, which it had helped create. Um, at first, Turkey wasn't so bothered by that because it believed you know, in, in the rebel cause. But it soon noticed that one of the big winners of the situation was firstly ISIS and, and, and jihadists, which were you know, not really attacking Turkey, but there were a few attacks at times, and that wasn't good. But more importantly, uh, Kurdish groups. So, so in, in Syria's east, in fact, before the rise of ISIS, Assad had actually deliberately withdrawn from eastern Turkey. Assad and his Iranian advisors concluded, as I said before, the most populated parts of Syria is in the West. You know, uh, the fight wasn't over the East, and Assad had previously had okay relations with um, Kurdish militia, and basically said, we're going to go, you guys can take over. It was a very informal arrangement, but that's effectively what happened. But of course, that was terrifying for Turkey. Because the Kurdish militia that came to dominate those Kurdish areas all along the eastern part of the Turkish border were a group called the PYD, which is the Syrian affiliate of the, the Turkish Kurdish separatist group, the PKK, which Turkey has been waging a war with ever since the 1980s. So as far as Turkey was concerned, terrorists that are worse than ISIS, in their view, are now in control of the eastern half of Syria, and especially the area along the Turkish border. So at the same time as this was happening, Russia intervened decisively in the Syrian civil war on Assad's side. So in 2015, Russia sent its air force to, to prop up Assad. And at that point, it became very clear to Turkey that for all its efforts, the rebels that it was backing were not going to overthrow Assad. And so this is the moment of a big shift in what you said goals for Turkey. So no, the goals were no longer about how you were overthrowing Assad. They recognized that wasn't going to happen. So instead, there were two goals. Firstly, they wanted the PYD, those Kurdish militants, off the border. You know, they didn't really care how they did it. Eventually, they came up with this plan of these pockets, you know, to, to keep, um, you know, to, to, to make uh, buffer states to keep the, the Kurdish militants away from the border. Um, but that, again, the number one priority was, you know, contain the threat of the PYD and the Kurdish militants. The other key priority ended up being to prevent the collapse of the, the remaining rebel pockets along the other side of the border. So again, the remaining rebel, that there, that's the western side of the Turkish border with Syria, Idlib, and what became those, those pockets. Because they recognized that if those pockets collapsed, a large number of those three to four million Syrians that I mentioned that are living there would flee Assad into Turkey. And with Turkey already having, like I said, three to four million Syrian refugees living in Turkey, and that you know, prompting some domestic strain, uh, they didn't want any more. So the priority then became about, okay, 
We need to we need to shore up Idlib. We need to make sure Idlib doesn't collapse. We need to keep the the Kurds off the border. And they have pursued that using a variety of tactics. One has been a military tactic, like I said. So they've been willing to send the Turkish armed forces into Syria to create these pockets to push first ISIS and then the PYD away from the border. They've also sent their military in to um, defend Idlib against Russian and, and Syrian attacks in 2020. But they've also used diplomacy. So they've used a lot of negotiation, especially with Russia. So after around 2015, 2016, actually it was 2016 actually, Turkey began to negotiate with Russia um, around a new process that Russia initiated called the Astana process, uh, which was a, a tripartite peace agreement between Russia, Iran and Turkey. And in it, they basically, it, it, it created a mechanism by which Turkey and Russia could work out different ways of getting what they both wanted from Syria. Now, sometimes that didn't work and, and things came to a head, especially, like I said, over that war in 2020 in Idlib. But by and large, what you've seen have been these negotiations between the two sides to, to achieve those two goals from Turkey's perspective that it wants. You know, so it, it had to ask Russia's permission, for example, to enter northern Syria to fight the Kurds on three occasions in 2016, 2018 and 2019, because Russia controls Syrian airspace. So they wouldn't have been able to go in without that um, Russian approval. Um, uh, so, so that this mechanism uh, is an example of how Turkey has used diplomacy as well as military power to achieve its goals. Two follow up questions. The first one. When we have the war in Ukraine, what's the Russian role in Syria at the moment? Because as you notice, the, the Syrian airspace is basically controlled by, let's say, a Russian military consultants. This is the proper English, how they call them. And the second question, what is the connection between Syria and Iran? Because also you, you said that Iran and Russia helped Assad. So why would Iran help Syria in this very difficult geopolitical conflict? Sure. Well, the, the first question is easier than the second. So the first, the first one about Russia, um, actually not a great deal as uh, the, the Ukraine war has not greatly affected Russia's presence in Syria. That's because actually Russia's physical presence in Syria is quite light. Uh, when they intervened in 2015, they made an agreement with Iran. Um, the, the then commander of the Al-Quds force, Qasem Soleimani, flew to Moscow to hash out a plan to help save Assad, because at that point, it looked like the rebels actually were on the move and might capture. They probably wouldn't have overthrown Damascus, but they looked like they might capture Assad's strongholds uh, along the Mediterranean coast, which would have been disastrous for Assad. So Iran and Russia hatched this plan. But in it, Russia was going to provide the air power, you know, uh, they they were given access to um, uh, a base in um, on the Mediterranean coast called Hanimim, which is still a, a major Russian base. Um, and from there, they were going to launch use the Russian air force to attack rebel and ISIS positions. Um, but the ground force, the ground troops, was mostly. Iranian and pro-Iranian groups. That was the, the, the agreement that was made. And of course, the Syrian army. The Russians also then spent a bit of time training the Syrian army, uh, improving their, their, their capabilities, especially a few particular uh, units and regiments like the Tiger forces. Um, and they became sort of like a far more effective fighting force. But that's the key, is that they didn't actually send a large number of Russian troops in. The Wagner group, the sort of mercenary groups, um, that are now famous in Ukraine, obviously also deployed in places like Libya and Central African Republic and Mali and places like that. Um, they were deployed um, in a limited capacity um, for particular combat operations, one of which actually led to a really large fatality uh, when the, American, the Americans accidentally bombed a large Wagner contingent, over 100 Wagner fighters were killed. Um, but because it wasn't officially the Russian army, it was this 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 consultant group, as you say, it wasn't as much of a, an international incident as it, as it could have been because they were mercenaries rather than officially the Russian military. Um, but there's there's not a, not a large number of the Wagner group there. There weren't many there in um, 2022 when the Ukraine war began. So whilst you know you might have people might have thought, oh well, you know 
if Russia is involved in Ukraine now, they're going to have to pull all their troops out of Syria to go and fight in Ukraine. But there aren't any troops in Syria. There's a very limited number of, you know, uh, the, the air force because, of course, the rebels didn't have an air force, so they didn't need, you know, they don't need much in order to control the skies over Syria. Um, and that hasn't changed. Like, there's no need, you know. Again, the Ukrainians don't have the Ukrainians don't have aerial supremacy either. So actually, it's not like you need to move those aircraft into Ukraine uh, because it's a very different kind of war being fought in Ukraine. So the military situation has not really been weakened for Russia in uh, because by Ukraine. The thing that has changed is the political situation, which is that um, Russia doesn't look as powerful as it did before the Ukrainian war. Before the Ukrainian war in the Middle East as a whole, uh, Russia was looking quite impressive. You know, it it had made this intervention in Syria, and it was then using that to um, become more involved in Middle Eastern politics. It was more involved in the Gulf. It was more involved in Libya. Um, it had forged closer um, relationships with Israel, with, um, uh, with, with Egypt, and a few other states. Um, because at that point, it looked like Russia was kind of like the rising military power in the region. The, the quagmire in Ukraine has damaged that. Now, if, of course, Putin goes on to triumphantly win the Ukrainian war, that might change and he might be able to, you know, claw back some credibility in the Middle East. Um, but it could go the other way, of course. I mean, if the Ukraine war goes really badly, it could lead to some kind of coup, as we've recently seen with, with Wagner's attempts in, in Moscow, um, at which point, you know, Russia would probably completely lose out in Syria because Syria is very much Putin's project. You know, it's not, it's not like um, Belarus or eastern Ukraine. It's not kind of like a, a natural place for Russia to be. Uh, and if there was disorder in central Russia, it's highly plausible that a new Russian government would say, OK, you know, we're going to cut our losses in Syria and move on. So, so that's how Ukraine could affect Russia's position. But in the short term, it's not really that affected. Right, I'll take a breath and I'll move on to Iran. Iran's position in Syria is really key to understand. You said, why is it would they get so involved in such a complex situation? Iran's relationship with Syria goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Iranian revolution. So the, so the regime that currently rules Iran, its very first ally was Syria. In 1979, you had this Iranian revolution. Uh, you had the vast majority of the world turning on this revolution. You know, no one wanted to support them. Obviously, the West were, te were horrified uh, that the, their ally, the Shah, had been overthrown, especially by this group that you know seemed to be saying things like death to America, and you know you had the Iranian hostage crisis, hostage crisis, and all this. You know the West was very hostile to Iran. The regional powers, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Egypt, were all very hostile to this new government as well. You know they were terrified of Islamist governments coming in. You know uh, they were worried that their own population might rise up against them and. And launch an Islamic, tried to launch similar Islamic republics. So they were terrified by this group. And of course, within a year, Iraq invaded Iran and, you know, attempting to strangle the new Islamic Republic. And the vast majority of Middle Eastern countries supported Iraq and sent money and weapons to help with this invasion. And the one country that didn't do that was Syria. And Syria did that for two reasons. They don't care about the Islamic Revolution. They've got no, you know, actually, you know, they're a very, you know, um, uh, Syria at the time was ruled by Bashar al-Assad's father, Hafez, like Bashar, a secular leader, an Arab nationalist, who in theory should not want anything to do with Iran, which is non-Arab, uh, and, you know, an Islamic Republic, which isn't secular. But they had several things in common. They both hated Saddam Hussein. So um, Syria, ironically, was ruled by the same ideology as Iraq, the Ba'ath ideology of Arab nationalism, but led by two different, you know, factions. Very much a kind of, um, you know, Sino-Soviet split. You know, you're the wrong kind of communist situation going on. It was very much the wrong kind of Ba'athist. And the Syrian government absolutely hated the Iraqi government and was very happy to uh, aid the Iranians in fighting uh, Iraq, which they did. And then on the other side of Syria, uh, Iran, being an Islamic Republic, uh, when it 
um, came to power, when the Islamic Republic came to power, they suddenly said that Israel was the enemy, which of course actually the previous regime, the Shah, had quite close relations with Israel, whereas the Islamic Republic said, no, actually, we, you know, Israel is the enemy of Islam. Um, and of course, Syria had been at war with Israel ever since Israel's creation, and Israel was occupying, and still does today, the Golan Heights. Uh, and at that point, um, they were fighting a proxy war in Lebanon in the form of the Lebanese Civil War. So Iran would support Syria in its war with Israel uh, via in Lebanon, and Syria would support Iran in its war with Iraq. So they forged this very close alliance. And of course, the Lebanese Civil War and the, and the Iran-Iraq War went on for a decade. They went on for ages, in which point these really close relations were forged between the Iranians and the Syrians. And importantly, this isn't just sort of a country to country relationship. It's a regime to regime. You know, it's 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 the Islamic Republic supports the Ba'ath regime of the Assads and vice versa. And so when that regime looked threatened, um, the Iranians did not want it to fall. They're like, you know, you know, these are our oldest friends, our oldest allies. We want to, them to keep in power, to stay in power. Now, on top of that, that's their starting point on top of that. Iran looked at the, the geostrategic situation of what was going on at that point. Iran had actually had a really successful decade um, before then. After the Americans had overthrown Saddam Hussein, the government that emerged in Iraq was a pro-Iranian government with allowing Iran to have a much deeper footprint in Iraq than it ever had before. Uh, and it wanted to hold on to those gains. And it was genuinely worried that if Assad lost power in Syria, and the rebels that took over became a pro-Western or pro-Saudi, which is Iran's other big rival government, then suddenly Iraq would have an enemy on its doorstep. And of course, Iran sees Iraq now as a kind of first line of defense from the West, it must stay an ally to protect itself. So it didn't want that. Moving in the opposite direction, in Lebanon, um, uh, Iran has a very close relationship with Hezbollah, which it helped found during the Lebanese civil war. And it uses that in its uh, enmity with Israel to launch attacks. And, and again, Hezbollah is the first line of defense against Israel. It, you know, um, Iran believes that Israel will not dare launch an attack against its nuclear program, for example, because it is scared of a um, counterattack from Hezbollah or northern Israel. So Iran uses Syria as a key transit route for weaponry through, from, from Iraq. So from Iran, through Iraq, through Syria, into Lebanon. And before that, it actually flew weapons into Damascus airport and then delivered them overland in, into Lebanon. Again, if Syria were to fall and a pro-American, pro-Israeli maybe, pro-Saudi regime took over, they would lose that key route to Hezbollah. Hezbollah would be starved of weapons. Hezbollah would probably cease to exist and certainly wouldn't be able to provide that level of support. And then there's a final reason. See, there's many reasons why Iran is interested. There's that geostrategic. There's also a kind of cultural religious component, which is that um, uh, Iran has you know, portrayed itself and, and pitched itself as a Muslim superpower, like it's always tried to get sort of like Muslims on side and present itself as a kind of like Muslim unifier against the West. But it's also at its at its core um, tried to st st stand up for um, the region Shia because it is the you know, there is only a few countries in the world that have a Shia majority. Iran is one of them. Iraq is another. Uh, Azerbaijan is another, and I think uh, Bahrain might be possibly. Uh, um, so. But there aren't many. And so Iran has always sort of stood up as this kind of, you know, defender of the Shia faith. And as the war went on in Syria, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the rebels um, who are mostly drawn from Syria's Sunni majority uh, were increasingly jihadist in character. And a lot of these jihadists um, took on a sectarian, anti-Iranian language and, and, and character. Ironically, a lot of the time, they, that was in reaction to what they saw as Iran's support for Assad. But even so, like you know, they were um, they were taking a very anti-Shia component. And so, um, Iran, as well as all the other reasons for supporting Syria, 
um, saw itself as defending Syria Shia. There's the, the that two, one or two percent who are 12 Shias, and then the Alawis that Assad belongs to. They are nominally Shia. They're not very religious actually in practice, but you know, they are nominally Shia. And on top of that, you have a few sacred Shia shrines in Damascus, particularly the Seder Zainab shrine, um, which again at Iran thought was very important for it to protect, and that it managed to then persuade Hezbollah, um, some other Iraqi Shia militia, and some other militia that it that it that Iran formed out of Afghani Shias and uh, Pakistani Shias to go to Syria to defend these shrines and actually fight for Assad as well. So there is this kind of religious component as well on top of the historical and the geostrategic component. To add to this uh, very interesting geopolitical puzzle, there are two pieces that we should also discuss today. The first one would be the term or the concept of 2011 era. So can we clarify what does it mean? And then can we connect that sort of geopolitical diplomacy in the Middle East to the very interesting fact that Syria was accepted back to the Arab League? Sure. So um, the 2011 the 2011 era is, I'm, I'm not sure if I've come up with this phrase, but I haven't seen it anywhere else. So I, I, I recently wrote a piece for Middle East Eye exploring this idea of, is the, the 2011 era at an end? And, and the idea behind that is that um, in 2011, was, was, well, it was actually late 2010, it was December 2010 was the beginning of what we become, became known as the Arab Spring or the Arab Uprising. And there was this wave of unrest across the Middle East, starting in Tunisia, spreading to Egypt, um, Libya, Syria, Yemen. And onwards, um, and the Syrian civil war, as it became, was part of that. It was, you know, an uprising that then became militarized and turned into a civil war. But of course, Syria wasn't alone. We saw civil wars in Libya and in Yemen as well. We saw a coup in 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 Egypt in 2013. We saw uh, a a a self coup, as you might call it, in Tunisia in 2021. There's been a lot of instability in the region. Now, the reason why I call it a particular era is that. After 2011, you saw the main geopolitical players in the region act mostly in relation to the consequences of, of what had happened in 2011. So you saw the emergence of, I think, three blocks of power, regional powers. You, something else is going on in terms of what the, the superpowers are doing. So what the United States is doing and what Russia are doing, they're, they're, they're responding in different ways themselves. But within the region itself, you have, on the one hand, Iran and uh, and its allies, sort of you know, Syria, um, Iraq, uh, to an extent Lebanon. You know, Lebanon's a very weak country, but you have you know, Hezbollah in government there and Hezbollah a very close Iranian uh, alliance. And they view these 2011 revolutions a particular way they want things to go in a certain direction they then have a second block that's dominated by saudi arabia and the united arab emirates but there's others in there like jordan and mo most of the gulf cooperation council countries and they view these um, uprisings another way their view is well we're not particularly happy with popular revolutions because we're quite conservative often monarchy countries some of them we will accept have to happen, but there's two things we really don't want to happen, which is the new governments are either pro-Iran, because Iran's our enemy, or pro-Muslim Brotherhood, because we're scared of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is kind of a, a popular Islamist organization. And then there's a third block, which is dominated by Turkey and Qatar. And they again view these rebellions a slightly different way, which is that mostly they're in favor of the rebellions with one or two exceptions. Um, but they actually really do want the Muslim Brotherhood to, or allies the Muslim Brotherhood to take over because they're quite close to the Muslim Brotherhood. So what you therefore get is in each of these countries where there's some unrest, so you know Turkey, sorry, not Turkey, Tunisia, Libya, Yemen, um, Syria, Egypt for a while, you get these three blocks, all to to a greater or lesser extent, trying to influence what's happening. So the, the, the outcome is what will suit them. So in Syria, you get you know, Iran trying really hard to stop the Syrian government from falling because it's a pro-Syrian 
uh, sorry, it's a pro-Iranian government. You have Saudi Arabia trying, well, sorry, you then have Turkey and Qatar trying really hard to overthrow Assad and supporting in particular rebel groups aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood. And then you have Saudi Arabia, uh, which is also getting involved. It wants Assad to be overthrown because it wants Iran, Iran's influence in Syria to lessen, but it also doesn't want the same groups that Turkey and Qatar want to um, uh, want to be victorious because it doesn't want the Muslim Brotherhood in charge. And this plays out in a similar way in Libya, in, in, in Yemen, in, in Egypt to a point and so on. So, and, and even though most of the rebellions themselves, the uprisings of 2011, are over by, you know, you might say in, in Syria, it's 2015, really, when the Russians intervene. In, in, in Egypt, it's 2013, when there's a military coup. In Tunisia, it's 2021, where there's a, uh, an internal coup. Um, uh, in Yemen, it's, it's probably still going on now, but, but most of them are, are largely over. But, but the shadow that those conflicts have caused has been much longer. So you get this bizarre situation where Turkey and the UAE who prior to 2011 were quite close or certainly didn't have any enmity to one another, really fall out. You know, they really fall out because of you know, the UAE supports the coup against the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt. And Turkey was a big ally of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And so they fall out for years. Um, and a similar situation happens with, you know, um, Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Um, the, the Qatar blockade, which runs from 2017 until 2021, is effectively about Qatar's support for the Muslim Brotherhood and Saudi Arabia and the UAE's opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood. So all of that has this you know, really long tail. And I would argue that that is beginning to end, that era. We're now beginning to move into a time where people aren't just defining their policy, governments aren't just defining their policies based on their reaction to the 2011 uprisings. And we've seen that recently in several ways. We've seen the UAE build bridges, well, Turkey actually build bridges with a lot of countries with the UAE, with, with Saudi Arabia, with um, Egypt. We've seen Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, agree to a detente, which was brokered by China in March of this year. And that looks like it's edging towards a, uh, a possible peace deal over Yemen, or at least a, 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 a some kind of more permanent ceasefire. And then we have, going back to your earlier point, Syria's re-entry into the Arab League. So, um, Syria was expelled or suspended from the Arab League in 2011 because the vast majority of the Arab countries, but not all, but the vast majority supported the rebels in the civil war. Their re-ignition, re readmission in, in 2023 is an acknowledgement by those countries that that policy has failed. The rebels are never going to win. Assad is going to be in charge of most of Syria for the foreseeable future, and they have to recognize that. But it is also related to this change in regional dynamic, this recognition that actually maybe the 2011 era is over. We have to accept things as they now are. The Saudis have made this deal with Iran, perhaps acknowledging, okay, you know, we, 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 fighting one another by proxy isn't working. Let's, let's come to a compromise. And one of those, the signs of that compromise is Saudi Arabia lifting its block on Assad's return to the Arab League, which pleases Iran. And one suspects that is the first step, uh, kind of like um, a concession to Iran in order to persuade Iran to engage more seriously with a peace deal on Yemen, which is what Saudi really wants. Was there any reaction coming from the Western countries about this uh, rejoinment of the Arab League? There was there was reaction, but also a recognition that um, not much could be done. So there was frustration. You saw sort of a few diplomatic frustrations, you know, uh, protests saying, um, you know, we, we, we won't recognize Assad. Assad is, is a war criminal um, and shouldn't be uh, accepted back into the Arab League. But um, the West lost interest in Syria quite a few years ago. Um, it, after the Russian intervention in 2015, it was clear that Assad wasn't going to fall. After the defeat of Islamic State, really around 2019, it was clear that the threat from jihadism wasn't what it was. And ever since the Russians and the Turks came up with a, uh, a de facto agreement 
uh, after the, the fighting finished in 2020. Um, it was also quite clear that you know there, there wasn't going to be heavy fighting in Syria anymore, or at least there didn't appear to be. So the West lost interest in Syria, and around the same time, or you know, not long after that, the Ukraine war broke out, which is taking up all of um, the West's bandwidth at the moment. On top of that, you're seeing a general shift by Western governments away from interest in the Middle East. You know, Obama began it with his pivot to Asia. Trump continued it with his focus on China, and Biden is doing the same now with a focus on China and Ukraine. So the Middle East is is it is less of a Western priority. So whilst the the the, the um, there's also a recognition that because it's less of a priority, Western governments have less leverage over Middle Eastern governments than they once did. So they simply can't tell the Saudis and the UAE, look, you can't let Assad back in the Arab League because the Saudis and the UAE will say, well, what are you, what are you going to do about it? Quite frankly. Um, so, you know, uh, so that, that, that there's that component. Um, that said, the West um, are unlikely to drop their opposition to Assad or sanctions against him that continue to exist, because that would be an admission of defeat. And they're not under sufficient pressure to do that. They're not really losing much by continuing to exclude Assad. And they would like, you know, on the matter of principle, because of the, the, the alleged war crimes and everything, they would like to him to remain isolated indefinitely, uh, and ideally to to engineer some kind of, you know, reconciliation deal whereby the the rebels are uh, brought into power, uh, some kind of power sharing agreement. But they recognise that um, they don't have the will or the capacity to do that. Can we expect uh, that anything happen, or anything will change in terms of the sanctions? And Syria, or because we still have some sanctions, you know, imposed on Syria, right? And and you know, is there any movement about about that, or or you know, this is frozen as well? That's a great question, and it's one of the biggest problems actually, because so so the, the, there have been sanctions on Syria ever since the well, since long before the war broke out, actually, actually due to other um, alleged you know um, uh, problems that the Syrian regime um, had. Uh, but they were stepped up considerably after 2011 um, to try to deter the Assad regime from launching its war. Sas sanctions almost never do this. You know, there are very few examples. There's a lot of academic scholarship that shows that sanctions very, very rarely um, achieve their goal of actually changing the behavior of an existing regime. And it didn't, they did not succeed. Um, you also get into what I've called in my book, The Battle of Syria, the... Um, the escalator of pressure, whereby you know they get on the escalator and then feel compelled when those when those sanctions don't work, to therefore put on even harsher sanctions to show that they're um, still committed to opposing the Assad regime, even though the harsh sanctions they put on haven't worked. Um, the current sanctions that are really biting are these sanctions called the Caesar sanctions, which were put on during the Trump administration. Though interestingly. They weren't from the Trump administration. They were actually led by Congress. Um, and what they do is they uh, punish any external company that deals with the Assad regime, whether they're from an ally or from an enemy state. Uh, and that's really problematic for not just the Assad regime, because, um, but also for a lot of these Middle Eastern governments that have just let Assad back into the Arab League, because a lot of them are hopeful that now that the war is largely over, or at least in most of Syria, they can contribute to the reconstruction effort, to rebuilding Syria, get this economy working again, and uh, you know maybe make some money for themselves. But the Caesar sanctions, if applied, will punish their companies for dealing with the Assad regime. So we're now in this position where most of the pressure against the sanctions isn't coming from the Syrian regime or the Russians or the Iranians, all of whom actually want the sanctions to be lifted, but actually from Middle Eastern countries um, that previously opposed Assad, most notably from the Gulf, especially the UAE, which really is pushing to have the sanctions lifted, um, because they want to be able to get their businesses in there without being punished. To answer your question as a roundabout way of saying it, it's unlikely that the US or the West will fold to this pressure. It's unlikely because it's a big statement to say, okay, actually, yeah, Assad, you've got away with it. We don't care about this. We'll lift the sanctions. Um, I think three circumstances that I can think of 
could change the situation. Number one is um, a unexpected change in regime in Syria. So some kind of coup or Assad dies or something like that. And the US used that as the excuse they've been looking for, say, okay, new regime will stop the French. A second situation, which is highly unlikely, but let's just, you know, say it, is if um, uh, there's a, a deal agreed with the Syrian government, the Russians somehow get some kind of, you know, I don't want to say fake, but, you know, engineered agreement whereby someone who says they're from the opposition is put into a powering sharing situation with Assad and everyone can say, okay, this is a new government, we can lift the sanctions now. But because Russia is now persona non grata in the West, the idea that the rest would reward Russia for that, you know, is unlikely. What's perhaps more likely is that the sanctions aren't lifted, but they just begin to be, they begin to be ignored. So, you know, the West allies start trading with Syria and the Americans quietly, you know, they maybe do a few slaps on the wrist, but, but, but start ignoring them. Now, this would be, you know, un- certainly some Congress men and women would push back against that and try and change it. But that might be sort of like the, the way this is edged out. But the most likely scenario is that the sanctions continue, not dissimilar to how Iraq was sanctioned in the 1990s. The last question for today's interview. In the first book, The Battle for Syria, International Rivalry in the New Middle East, and the second book, which is upcoming in 2024, Battleground, The Struggle for the New Middle East in 10 Conflicts. In both books, you use New Middle East. Is this a concept or is it something sort of like your theory or is it something like internationally recognized concept? What does it mean, a New Middle East? So it's something that I mention in the introductions to both books because I think you have to justify using that term. It's something that there has been a debate amongst scholars um, ever since the Arab Spring, the Arab Uprising. You know, is this a new regional order? Is this something? Is something new happening or is it actually more of the same? And I go back to, and I mentioned this in my recent article by um, for Middle East Eye, uh, I go back to Fred Halliday's notion of the, the, the dangers of the great turning points views of history. He says that on the one hand, every 10 years or so in the Middle East, there do seem to be these great turning points, you know, uh, major shifts like 9-11 or the Gulf War or the Iranian Revolution or the Suez Crisis or the Six-Day War that seem to really upend the international relations of the Middle East and define the decade that follows. He says that whilst that's true, there's also a lot of continuity. You know, it's not like everything changes, a lot stays the same. And I would say the same of that, you know, so a lot has stayed the same, but I believe enough has changed as a consequence of 2011 to mark, to to allow us to call it a new Middle East. Something changed after 2011, Um, or at least around the 2011 era. It wasn't quite, you know, 2011, that was the starting point. And the main changes that I identified that are worth noticing are number one, the the, the, the wider great power picture changed. That is the United States stepped back. You know, it was the dominant power in the region, really from the 1970s, but especially after the 1990s. You know, the 1990s, at the end of the Cold War, the beginning of the Gulf War of 1991, you know, is the era that we call the Pax Americana, where most states in the region define themselves either for or against the United States, one way or the other. And the US was this dominant force. And very little could happen diplomatically without the US being involved or its approval being sought something like that. It was very much a dominant era. Now, the US effectively threw that away with the invasion of Iraq in 2003, which destabilized the region and challenged its its, uh, position in the region. But we don't actually see the the consequences of that until the 2011 era. So it begins in 2003. But of course, the US is still in, in Iraq at that time, you know, and it still looks like it's dominating. But it's actually only a 2011, especially under Obama, and then followed by Trump, and Biden when you say, oh, actually, no, the US is behaving differently now. It's not fully withdrawn, but it's no longer the unquestioning dominant, the dominant power. So that's one major shift. The second major shift is a relation to that, is that in that vacuum, 
regional and external powers that weren't as heavily involved before become way more independent and start pursuing their own independent policies separate from the United States. In essence, what you get is the development of a multipolar Middle East, where, I mean, I mentioned earlier the idea of three blocks, but they're very loose blocks. Um, and a lot of the time, players within that block are doing their own thing. So Saudi Arabia and the UAE, whilst they're often aligned, often behave independently and don't always do things completely in lockstep. You know, it's not, this isn't the Warsaw Pact where they absolutely have to sort of, you know, check with Riyadh before they do something. It's nothing like that. Likewise, Qatar and Turkey do very different things. Um, and even you get players like Egypt, which are aligned with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but they're still an independent power and doing their own things in places like Libya, Sudan. Um, uh, so, so you're getting a lot of these players intervening independently. And then on top of that, you have you know, great powers, you know, Russia and China, who are also intervening, especially Russia, uh, you know, as we've seen in Syria, um, but also in other places like, um, excuse me, like, like in Libya. And China is an independent player as well in a slightly different way, has a strong commercial presence in the Gulf. But as we've seen recently with the deal it, it negotiated between Iran and Saudi Arabia, you know, as a diplomatic actor, and of course, you know, the, the invention of the Belt and Road Initiative, which you know, it, uh, you know, loads of Middle Eastern countries have signed up to that, which gives China this you know, far greater diplomatic heft that it didn't have before. So yeah, that shift, that multipolar Middle East is really significant. Two other significant shifts. I, I say there's sort of four, 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 four shifts. Um, um, the, the third is the number of fragile states, or as I call them in the Otacone book, battlegrounds, right? You know, grounds in which these regional and global rivalries are played out. Now, there has been, those have existed in the Middle East for a very long time, So, but, but previously they were limited in number. So Lebanon was a classic kind of battleground for a long time. After 2003, Iraq became a battleground, but that was largely it. You now, after 2011, added to those two, which are still already quite weak states, Yemen, Libya, and Syria. And on top of that, what I say in, in my book anyway, is that battleground shouldn't just be viewed in terms of violent battle, battles. They should also be seen as political battles. And you increasingly see after 2011, more and more weak states who are weak politically, which allow their politics to be influenced by the outside as well. So whereas previously you've had these quite robust dictatorships, which are brutal, but actually not easily influenced by the outside, you see that shattering. And countries like Egypt until, well, between 2011 and 2013, um, but also parts of uh, the Kurdistan region, uh, the Horn of Africa becomes a sort of like extended uh, extension of the Middle East um, as well. These areas, and Tunisia to an extent as well, these areas increasingly see their politics get influenced by external players. You know, you have them, yeah, Sudan that's happening as well. You see different faction, domestic factions, being supported and encouraged by different external players, um, not just in violent conflict, but also in political conflict as well. And that's very much what Iraq looks like today, for example, and Lebanon. So yeah, so, 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 so the number of battlegrounds really, really increases. And the fourth change, which I think is not so significant, but is still worth mentioning, is again, perhaps as a consequence of the increased weakness of the states in the region and the number of fragile states, are the number of non-state actors operating. So that happens both internally, and you get a lot of, you know, in countries that shatter into civil war, like Syria and Libya and Yemen, you get non-state militia forming that are challenging the, the established government. But you also get transnational militia that are forming. So, you know, the most famous of those are obviously Islamic State, which is transnational from Iraq into Syria. But also, I, I mentioned before the PKK and the PYD. These are Kurdish militia that originated in, Syri in, in, in Turkey, but then start having a presence in, in Syria, in Iraq, and to a lesser extent in Iran as well. Um, and then you get some of these militia becoming, you know, um, state-based tra uh, militia becoming transnational. So Hezbollah, which up until 2011 was a Lebanese-only militia, after 2011 starts traveling into Syria to fight the civil war there. It gets sent by Iran into Iraq to start training militia there and, and uh, into Yemen to start training the Houthis. You know, so suddenly you get these groups that are... You know, and then and then we talk about the group, you know, mercenary groups like the Wagner group, you know, that that operate not just in Syria, but also in Libya. You know, so, so these 
entities are operating, you know, uh, it, it, the, the, trans, the, the non-state actors are a significant addition to um, the, the, the regional landscape. That said, my one caveat is when it comes to those non-state actors, we should not overstate them. Most of them are still in some way controlled or heavily influenced by particular states. So Hezbollah are heavily influenced by, by Iran. The Wagner Group, obviously heavily influenced until what was going on recently, the Russian government. The, one, the two exceptions are the PKK and Islamic State, or, or other jihadists, which tend to operate independently. So that's why I'd call it a new Middle East. It's sufficiently new to warrant you know, that title, even though there's a lot of other continuities from the past that I, I haven't mentioned in that brief summary. So Christopher Phillips, a professor of international relations at Queen Mary University of London. Chris, thank you very much for your time, for your fascinating talk, talks about Syria and your enthusiasm about the topic. It's a, it's a great topic to research. It's a complicated, but it's very interesting. And I think it has so many implications. So we can speak about Syria till, till the morning here, and we will still not be able to cover all the all the issues and all the problems and, and all the implications. But thank you very much for having some time for our viewers. And I wish you good luck with your new book and your research. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you later.